Drippin' Sports with Matty Ice, back and more fire than ever. And now, your host, the Iceman. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Drippin' Sports with Matty Ice. I am your host, Matty Ice, and we are going to talk the MLB All-Star Game and the MLB Hall of Fame this week. But before we get started, a little bit of business. Please remember to visit MattyIceMedia.com to support all the other podcasts that we have, including Drip, Trip, and Spill and The Manual with Cleve Wason. If you are listening in the podcasting world, please remember to subscribe, rate, and review. It means the world. A big shout out to whoever has given a review thus far. And if you want to hit me up on Twitter, the handle is at Matty Ice Freights, and that's really the best place to get me. Last week was the return episode of the show, and I had Cleve on, and we talked about a lot of things, including Zach Wilson and his new MILF obsession. And while that was a lot of fun, I wanted to get back to a little bit of the analysis that I had I guess, become accustomed to doing on the show, which is one of the things that I missed in the first place. Over the past week, a lot of things have happened in the sporting world. Well, actually, wait a minute, I take that back. Nothing has happened in the sporting world in the last week. This is probably one of the worst times to have a sport, a sports podcast in the entirety of the sport calendar. And why is that? Well, there's no football. The all-star break, which we'll get to, is on. And really, the only thing that you have is the ESPYs. There's no basketball, there's no hockey, there's no football, and baseball is on a minor break. That's all that we have right now. And it is one of the low periods in the entirety of the sports calendar. And that brings me to the idea of the MLB All-Star Game. Last year, I did an episode around this time, and the show was very, very new back then. And I talked about the fact that I love baseball. I talked about the fact that I loved baseball from a young, young age. I grew up watching the Red Sox and the Major League Baseball All-Star Game was something that I grew up absolutely loving. That love for the All-Star Game has continued to wane over the years because of the way that baseball is structured now. The game that I grew up watching is no longer the game that it is today. I mean, that's just the way that it is. Baseball has changed so much through the strategy that it has become a different game than I'm accustomed to watching. But last week, around Wednesday, I'm putting together the episode for this show or thinking about everything that I was gonna do for the podcast this week. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, wasn't the MLB All-Star game last night? So I go to my phone as I am wont to do, and I look at ESPN, and there you go, the Major League All-Star game, the American League wins three to two. And I was just blown away. I had forgotten about the All-Star game. It's something that's never happened. Usually it is right in my sights, but as the years have gone by, and maybe as my life has become a lot more busy, I mean, you gotta remember I'm a dad now, I'm a podcaster now, so perhaps there's just not as much time in my day as I had used to have. But usually the MLB All-Star Game is something that I like to tune into because even though baseball has changed so much fundamentally in my view, it still feels like the same game at the All-Star Game. Maybe it's because you get all the pageantry, a lot of times they are steeped in history during the All-Star Game, but something about this year, it just never happened. So seeing that the American League won is, is fine, And then of course the home run derby and everything that goes along with it, those are things that I used to watch, but I feel as if they have become stale. To me, the home run derby doesn't have the same oomph that it used to. I'm not really sure why. Maybe it's because a lot of the great hitters aren't involved. Maybe it's because of today's stars being way different than they used to be. I'm not really sure. Ironically enough though, Juan Soto of the Washington Nationals, for now, wins the home run derby after the news that had been put out that he had turned down something like a $440 million contract. I wanna talk about that for a second. I was in a text thread with some friends about that and the people that were on the thread were basically saying, how could you turn down that kind of money? I just wanna point out from a business perspective, this is just business practices. This is gamesmanship in the art of a free agency. These teams are going to put out the numbers that these players have refused because it is going to give them a little bit of leverage in their bargaining position, or at least that's what they think. I want to also remind you that Juan Soto is 100% a Scott Boris client. Therefore, this is a tactic that is not going to work. Scott Boris is a lot of things. He's not my favorite human being in the world. I'm pretty sure he's not the favorite human being of a lot of people in executive positions within Major League Baseball, but he is one hell of of an agent. To be one hell of an agent, I think you have to be a pretty crappy human being. 
And I think he has managed to do that to become one of the richest people and probably in all of baseball, if you think about it. Think about how many contracts Scott Boris has has been a part of. Big time contracts. Like when we talked about the strike this past winter, and we talked about how the people that were involved, the people that were seen as representatives of the MLB Players Union were really not the people that the union was fighting for. The Max Scherzers of the world are 100% in that top 1% of Major League Baseball salaries. And Scott Boris happens to represent a great deal of those clients. So he has become rich if you think about the 5 to 10% cut that agents typically get. I'm sure he gets a little bit more because he is a high profile agent. He is the agent. But the fact that Juan Soto wants out of Washington so bad isn't necessarily, I mean, it has nothing to do with the fact that he turned down a contract. Scott Boris clients are going to hit the market 100% of the time. And honestly, from a business perspective, it's the smart thing to do. They should hit the market because if you're banking on yourself and you have seen the market, you're going to put yourself out there with the results that you have and try to get the maximum contract that you can get to set yourself up for the rest of your life. And again, most of us are never going to sniff that kind of money, not even just in a year for these players, but we're just never going to sniff that kind of money in general. And so for us, relatively speaking, it's so much money that we do think to ourselves, well, how could you turn that down? But it's all relative to your market. I say this a lot, and maybe it's my economics background from when I was in college, but it's all relative to your market. If we, the fans, want to change the market and want it to be less ridiculous, then we have to stop going to games, have to stop buying merchandise, have to stop supporting these teams, plain and simple. All of us need to do that. The thing is, is we're not going to do that because it's impossible to do. We love our sports teams and we love our sports, so we're going to continue to show up. So Juan Soto will most likely not be a Washington National, and it's not because they can't afford him. It's because other teams are going to be able to afford him better. The Washington Nationals sold out to win a World Series, and at this point for the foreseeable future, they're probably not going to be winning a World Series or sniffing the playoffs. It's kind of how a lot of these smaller market teams work, although I would argue Washington, D.C. should not be a small market. 100% the Nationals should be spending a little bit more, and they are trying to spend on Juan Soto. Unfortunately, if he had a different agent, they may be able to get a deal done, but I just do not see Scott Boris allowing them to not get the maximum amount, and who knows? Perhaps Soto will be in Washington because that will be the maximum amount that they get, but if he has a great second half of the year, if he's even on the Nationals come the trade deadline in a few weeks, who knows? But I want to get to the idea of the All-Star game and missing it. Now, the MLB All-Star game is one of the few All-Star games that happens in the middle of the season. Well, actually, that's not true. I think it's one of the most high-profile ones that happens in the middle of the season. I guess you think about the NBA and you think about the NHL, but I think something that they do better in both of those leagues is they at least make it a fun exhibition that really doesn't mean anything. They're not trying to assign some stakes to it that I think Major League Baseball still tries to do with the All-Star game. Remember, home field advantage was basically dictated by the winner of the All-Star game. It may still be. That's how out of touch I am with the game. The All-Star game used to be a place where you only saw these players play each other. Perhaps this is a rehash from last year, but you didn't see Pete Rose play the American League. The National League only played the National League. The American League only played the American League, but now with interleague play so rampant throughout the league, and not even just for a month. Remember, the month of June used to be the interleague month for a while there. I actually liked that. I actually liked that it was reserved for one part of the of the baseball calendar because that meant that you only it was a special attraction. You only saw it at certain times. Now interleague play happens all the time. There are no rules in scheduling and all teams play each other. The question that comes to my mind is what is the point of the All-Star game? Outside of just highlighting players, you can do that without having a game. You can do that without having the, the pop and circumstance and everything that goes long, along with it. You could just say these people are All-Stars and call it a day. It's kind of like the Pro Bowl. What is the point of the Pro Bowl? Nobody cares about it. The players don't really like it. It's not real football. But that's the thing about baseball is that the game is exactly the same. These managers have to manage the game exactly the way that they would a regular game because the sport can't really be dumbed down in any way. There are certain ways that you can, but it would take forever. Imagine if they just threw fastballs so guys could hit. These innings would take forever. So there's no way that you can dumb it down the way that you can in basketball when there's a clock. There is no clock in baseball. 
So I find the action to be not that compelling because there's a lot of starters. You only see guys for a very, very short amount of time. And even if they do something spectacular, in today's game, the relievers are so good and they throw such superhuman pitches that at this point, once that happens, these are the best relievers in the league right now, and you're not gonna see any runs. Offense is gonna be down. That's why when the relievers came in and it was three to two, it stayed three to two. But Major League Baseball is trying to experiment with some different things that they are not willing to implement in the regular season. This is what I think is the problem with Major League Baseball right now. They are unwilling to try anything new. They did so last year and they did so in the pandemic year because quite frankly, they had to. Certainly they are willing to do certain things like expanding the playoff and I believe they eliminated the shift, but I think they need to do more. The problem that baseball has right now is its fan base continues to get older and older. And some people might argue that that's not the case, but I do believe that is the case. If you look at the people that are fans of these teams, the kids that are fans are kids because their parents are fans. But what happens when they get older and their attention spans become even smaller? We talk about kids having small attention spans. Adults have small attention spans now. Think about it this way. One of the reasons that this show is not on YouTube is because the attention spans that people have are so minimal. But when I do put YouTube content out for other shows, shorts are what get the most attention because it's 60 seconds or less of your time. That's how little time people are willing to dedicate towards something even as minuscule as a podcast. They're only willing that 60 seconds. It's why TikTok is so so popular. And so imagine if you're, ha you're trying to sell a three and a half to four hour game 162 times in a season. That is a huge sell. And you're just not gonna be selling it to people who continually spend their time in less and less spaces of time throughout their day, throughout their lives. And I think that's the problem. The other thing that Major League Baseball has an issue with is that their players, the interesting ones, are not really given a platform to be seen as interesting. The best players in the league, Mike Trout, Shohei Otani, they're just not interesting. Shohei Otani is interesting on the field, but if you're not getting people to watch the game on the field, it doesn't matter how interesting his play is. You're trying to get people attracted to the game that aren't already attracted to the game. One of the reasons why people are attracted to say the NBA or the NFL is because these players have personalities. You know who they are. You know more about them. The interesting players are allowed to be a, a, be a little bit more marketable on, in today's world. And Major League Baseball needs that. Unfortunately for baseball, so much of the rosters are, are made up of people for whom English is not their first language. And that is tough because now you have people who don't want to look like fools by speaking a language that is not their main language. So why are we not trying to make them interesting in their native language? The way that they mic up, mic'd up pitchers during the game, I thought that that was great. Not just mic'd up, but asking them questions, getting them to be more themselves during those pitches, during those at-bats. That to me is more interesting. I need to see them go farther if you want to get a younger crowd. And so I wondered to myself, when is baseball going to lean into that? Because fans like me, for whom baseball used to be my favorite sport, it's no longer my favorite sport anymore. And it's because the game just does not interest me the way that it did. I do love watching in the playoffs, don't get me wrong. But even last year when the Red Sox were in it, I didn't find myself glued to the TV the way that I once was. I'm not sure why. And that's a perfect segue to the times of the past and we're talking about the Baseball Hall of Fame. One thing that happens around this time is the Hall of Fame class, whomever is voted in, is inducted into the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. Now, I was very fortunate to go to Cooperstown way, way a long time ago when I was younger. I remember my mom had this idea, well, let's go to the Baseball Hall of Fame on the 4th of July. Cooperstown, New York, baseball, what's more American than that? It's got to be a great town for the 4th of July. I'll never forget how disappointed she was that Cooperstown, New York doesn't do anything special for the 4th of July. The Baseball Hall of Fame didn't do anything special back then. She was so disappointed. However, as a kid, I didn't care because we got to go to the Baseball Hall of Fame. And as a huge baseball fan back then, that's all that I really cared about. The Baseball Hall of Fame is hallowed ground to me. There are a lot of players in the Hall of Fame, but to me, it is so difficult to get in. Now, I have a lot of qualms with the way that they vote these players in. And I think a lot of it has to do with reporters liking or not liking players. Right now, you've got players like Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens. Barry Bonds, who should 100% be in. Roger Clemens, you could probably make an argument. Pete Rose is not in. 
and there's a lot of politics that take place around the baseball hall of fame politics to me that don't exist for other hall of fames especially football where they pare down the classes through voting and meetings i kind of like that for baseball you have 15 years of eligibility you have to reach a certain percentage on the ballot and things have changed over the years the designated hitter has become a position that has been more greatly researched and considered because of just how important and integral they are in the game so much more today where there is a universal dh now this year's hall of fame inductee is one that is very very close to my heart and that is david ortiz or big poppy as we know him in boston now i haven't lived in boston or new england for a very very long time but as a longtime red sox fan something that has been passed down to me from generation to generation and even though i don't watch baseball the way that i used to i would love for my son to be a red sox fan David Ortiz means so much to that community, so much more than baseball, and to see him get his due and be in the Hall of Fame is emotional for me. It tells me that I'm getting older. It tells me that so much of my life has passed me by to this point, and that a lot of the greatest memories that I have related to sports, David Ortiz was a, was a part of. I wanted to go over some of my favorite David Ortiz moments over the years, and even though David Ortiz is a He's a Red Sox legend. He's definitely one of the best designated hitters of all time. He does come with a slightly complicated legacy. He did pop on the Mitchell Report, which was put out of people who had tested positive for steroids. Now, I don't remember all of the ins and outs of that. Personally, even if he was on the list, I think that his talent overcame anything that he did. I remember he took a dip in his career about 2008, 2009, resurrected himself in 2010, and played until 2016 and even had some World Series moments in between those years. Big Poppy was a great human being. He was a great teammate. And even though he might have gotten caught up in the steroid stuff the way that other players did back then, just advocated for Barry Bonds to be in the Hall of Fame because I believe that Barry Bonds' talent was Hall of Fame caliber with or without the steroids. And I believe that about David Ortiz. When he played, the DH was not the way that it is today. He didn't play the field, it was sort of a liability. But one thing that David Ortiz did above all was he was clutch. He was there when you needed him. And sometimes that is what puts somebody over in terms of being in the Hall of Fame or not. Somebody who is not in the Hall of Fame who will probably never get in the Hall of Fame because unfortunately, by today's standards, he's a crazy person and that is Kurt Schilling. Kurt Schilling and David Ortiz share a lot together because in the playoffs, they came through when you needed them. And that's the thing I remember about David Ortiz. I remember more about him than just sports though. So let's go over some of these. Starting at number five, when David Ortiz broke Jimmy Fox's single season home run record for the Red Sox, I wanna say it was 05 or maybe 06. Why is that significant? Jimmy Fox is a retired number at Fenway Park. He is one of the most prominent Red Sox players of all time, a well-loved player. And for David Ortiz to pass a Red Sox great like that, put him in the annals of Red Sox history. Now you gotta remember this was after they brought home the 2004 World Series. The curse had been broken. So this team was really off the hook. This franchise was off the hook because they finally got over the hump. That was a great, great moment. Number four, passing Ted Williams on the all-time home run list. He passed other players like Frank Thomas, but Ted Williams. Ted Williams is my favorite Red Sox of all time. I have never seen Ted Williams play. I obviously will never see Ted Williams play. Ted Williams will always be my favorite baseball player of all time because I believe he is the best hitter in all of Major League Baseball history. Ted Williams, like many players back then, lost four years of his career to World War II. He served in the US Army during that time. He gave or could have given his life for the pursuit of freedom during World War II. Imagine if he had played those four years, how many home runs would he have hit? How many 300 or 400 batting average seasons would he have had? Ted Williams was amazing. And so for David Ortiz, who again, I understand, played longer and only hit, but for him to pass Ted Williams, that definitely meant something, especially in the annals of Fenway Park and Red Sox history. Number three, the 2013 Red Sox team is always going to be remembered for one thing, but the one moment that I remember from those playoffs, I remember my wife and I at the time were dating. We had just gotten together earlier that year. 
this was the first time that she had been sort of indoctrinated into watching me watch the Red Sox. I really couldn't explain to her what it meant at the time. They had won a few World Series already, but 2004 was so special to me that I really couldn't explain to her what it meant to the region. My wife was born and raised in the South. She lived in Hawaii for many years, so she wasn't really into baseball the way that New Englanders are into baseball. 2013 ALCS, that team had a lot riding on it because of something that had happened earlier in that year that I will get to later. And they were down one game to none in the ALCS. They were down in game two. David Ortiz came up, down four runs, the bases loaded, and hit one of the most iconic grand slams in Red Sox history. Into the bullpen in right field, the famous picture of that security guard police officer with his hands up, so many things happening there. And it was another iconic moment for David Ortiz. He had had so many, 2004, 2007, you name it, he had had so many. And that was just another one to add, and it was such a great thing. I remember my wife was sitting on my lap, he hit the ball and I threw her off and just said, get out, get out, get out. And it did. And I just went so crazy that I slipped and fell. It was a whole thing. We still talk about that today, but it was one of the greatest moments. And she got to see that firsthand how crazy I can be. David Ortiz was synonymous with game winners, of course. And in 2004, those playoffs were just a roller coaster ride emotionally, of course. But the ones that I remember the most were in games four and five of the ALCS. Now, remember, the Red Sox were down three games to none to the New York Yankees, and in game four, Dave Roberts historically stole the base. The rest is history. Against Paul Quantrill in like the 16th or 18th inning, David Ortiz hit a home run to keep the Red Sox alive. The very next night, he hit another game-winning single to keep the Red Sox alive and send them back to New York for game six and seven. The rest, as they say, is history, and David Ortiz and the Red Sox defeated the Yankees and became the only team in Major League Baseball history to come back from a three to nothing deficit. It's really hard to do, and it's one of the most iconic moments in Major League history. And those two hits really resonate with me. I was in college watching them with my friend Jeremy and just being up till one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning watching those games, going to class the next day. There was a rain out in one of the games and there was no break in games four, five, six, and seven. So we were up in Adam every night and watching it. And it was just a roller coaster ride of emotions for all of that. But the end product of them winning the World Series in 04 was magical. The number one David Ortiz moment for me. I mentioned earlier the 2013 team being special. And the reason that that team was special was not for any reason, but a bad reason. In April of 2013, a few days before I actually met my wife, I was at a movie, I was seeing Jurassic Park, I think it was in theaters for the 25th anniversary or something like that. And I went to see it, I was randomly off that day, it was a Monday, and it was Marathon Monday. I was in the throes of my running career back then, so I loved the Boston Marathon, but I decided to go see a movie by myself. When I got out of the movie, my text messages were blowing up because there had been a bombing at the finish line of the Boston Marathon. The two bombers had put pressure cooker bombs and shrapnel everywhere. Many people's lives were changed that day, and they continued to be changed, not only in death, but in survival too. And I remember feeling that so badly. A city that I had grown up loving, a sport that I loved. I knew somebody that was at the marathon that weekend cheering people on. And I just, the whole thing was such a crazy, crazy mess. And it came on the cusp of so many things that had happened over the last decade with 9-11, the Virginia Tech shooting, now this. So many things had seemingly touched my life in a way that were just, they were incomprehensible. And I remember the first game back from that, the Red Sox were on national television because it's Boston. And of course, you know, this is the first game. And they asked players to say things and they had tributes to the marathon survivors and the victims. And David Ortiz went up there and started saying his stuff. And then he said, this is our fucking city. And Fenway Park erupted. It's an iconic moment for David Ortiz. He will always be remembered for that. I said he'd be remembered more for things off the field. And to me, that moment is what he will be remembered for most in the Boston community. Outside of Boston, he'll be remembered for his heroics, his home runs, and his smile. And I think that in Boston, he'll be remembered for those things, no doubt. But ultimately, he will be remembered for it's our fucking city. So thank you to David Ortiz. And congratulations to David Ortiz 
And I think that that is a wonderful, wonderful achievement. And honestly, he deserves it. There's a lot of Red Sox in the Hall of Fame now. And to see him and Pedro in the Hall of Fame together, it just makes me, it tickles me because those are two of my favorite Red Sox players of this generation. And while they're not my favorite of all time, they are certainly up there in terms of favorites. So congratulations to David Ortiz. In the NFL, your quarterback is your main position. It is key. If you do not have yourself solidified at quarterback, you're kind of in trouble. And the Arizona Cardinals came up to that place where they had to make a decision. And they decided that they needed to stick with their quarterback now remember, Kyler Murray had had a whole lot of drama in the offseason with taking the Cardinals off of his social media, which is a new thing for players to do now. They like to ha add dramatics to all this and whatever. Well, when it came time to sign, Kyler Murray signed an extension with the Arizona Cardinals, and it was $160 million guaranteed. I can't remember the number, maybe 240 total, something like that. So the Arizona Cardinals feel as if they have their guy. Cliff Kingsbury, in my mind, is on the hot seat this year because I think that he needs to perform in the playoffs. They made the playoffs last year and got absolutely embarrassed, which is what made Kyler Murray upset in the first place. I think overall, this is a fine move. I think Kyler Murray is fine, and I think that he, has, he is talented. What is his ceiling in terms of being a quarterback in the NFL? That remains to be seen. And I do think some of the extracurriculars that take place with him, which include some of these temper tantrums, are something to watch. Now, what I learned today is that in the contract, there is something built for him to have four hours at least of study time for film. That's a little bit problematic to me. And I don't know if that's just semantics in the contract of something that they put there just to have something there. But to me, it feels like, well, how much film was he watching before? Was he not dedicating himself to the position? Is this something that they are a little bit fearful that they're not going to get the maximum, I guess, attention of Kyler Murray? I don't know how you'd feel today if you were a Cardinals fan. I mean, I would assume that if you're on board with this move that you're happy. But I think it is something to watch because I think when you look at players today, while I am pro player, I think it's worth noting that even though I'm pro player, I do think that they need to hold up their end of the bargain. Debo Samuel wanting more money because he has been used the way that he has been used, I can kind of understand that. I can understand being on a rookie deal and wanting to sign an extension because you feel that you are worth more than what you are getting paid for what you are being asked to do. The NFL is a ruthless business, folks. Those coaches will run you into the ground at any time because they want to get the maximum value out of you for the least amount of money. With the amount of money that these teams are paying for guys, they're going to do that. So Debo Samuel getting paid seems a little bit more, I guess, I can understand it more, but Kyler Murray throwing a temper tantrum because the team lost and he felt like, hey, I'm doing enough. That is bordering on me guy. And me guys are always are tricky. Me guys don't really sit well with me. I'm going to be watching Kyler Murray all season long because while I believe he is talented, I do question his work ethic a little bit. And I would question his work ethic no matter what he looked like or what team he played for, because I think that there is a way to go about your business and a way to not go about your business. Lawrence Taylor could show up to games without having looked at tape and you knew he was gonna be fine. That's a rarity. And so I think the Cardinals made the right choice because they had to, because again, in today's NFL, the economics are, if you don't sign this guy, what's your backup plan? And I don't think that they have a backup plan. Who does have a backup plan? It's hard. So unless they were going to start over, this was the move that they were going to make. Now, up next is Lamar Jackson. And of course, you have Joe Burrow. You know, the Bengals say that they are all in on signing Joe Burrow. And I would freaking hope so. The guy just took you to a Super Bowl. The most prominent playoff run that the Bengals have had in, what, 30 years? And the, he's their future. So if they aren't all in on signing Joe Burrow, then what the hell are they doing? Sign that man. Sign him for whatever he wants because he's all in. You know he is all in. And he's all in with that city and that city is all in with him. So make sure you keep that good thing. And you know what? I understand it. In today's NFL market, when you sign your quarterback, you got to start making tricky accounting decisions. That's the way that it works, man. You just have to make it happen. So let's hope that Joe Burrow gets paid and let's hope that Lamar Jackson gets paid. Lamar Jackson, I think, is an, another interesting case but I think ultimately he will get paid because I think, again, the alternative is to not pay him and find another quarterback. And that is not easy to do. 
One last thing before I get you out of here. The rumor mill has been swirling about two players in the NBA, and those are Russell Westbrook and Kevin Durant. Two guys that have been known to dislike each other over the years and two guys that have known to dislike a lot of people over the years. Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook, to me, are top five me guys in the NBA today. And the rumors about both of those players getting traded have been percolating over the last couple of weeks, and I think that they are finally starting to pick up some real steam here. Now that the NBA draft is over, now that mini camps are coming up soon and the season's gonna be starting before we know it, these teams have to figure out what they're going to do. Kevin Durant doesn't wanna play for Brooklyn despite the fact that he just signed a four-year extension. And Russell Westbrook, I think, was a bad fit for the Lakers, and he played horribly for the Lakers. Ironically enough, during his exit interview, he felt that he was fine. He felt that he didn't have to do anything. And honestly, Russell Westbrook is the antithesis of accountability. But I have to laugh because the rumors that we are hearing right now about both of these players could not be the worst situations ever. Kevin Durant right now is being heavily sought out by the Boston Celtics and Russell Westbrook, one of the teams that is in the lead for his services is the Utah Jazz. I can't even begin to tell you how awful of an idea both of those are. Remember what it was like when Kyrie Irving played in Boston? Remember how all of that ended? Remember what it's like when he goes back to Boston? Boston is a city that I love, do not get me wrong. I just talked about it earlier when it came to the David Ortiz stuff. But Boston also has a problematic history with the way that they have treated black players over the course of time. And that is not just something that happened 40 years ago. It's happened recently. When Kyrie Irving was there, the kid throwing a full bottle of water at Kyrie Irving, that's dangerous. And why do you do that? The way that they treat other players, the way that they call them names. You've heard so many stories of Red Sox opposition players the way that they were treated. Carl Crawford was a Red Sox, the way that he was treated. And I can't even imagine Kevin Durant coming to this team. Kevin Durant is a player that is extremely talented. He's one of the best players in the league. Hell, he might even end up being a top 15 or top 10 player of all time. But his commitment is directly correlated to how much he wants to be there. And I don't get the sense that Kevin Durant is going to give 100% to just any old team. He has to want to go there, but he has no leverage in the matter. He doesn't have a no trade clause and the Nets are going to get the maximum value for him. That's just what they're going to do. It's a, it's a business decision. Kevin Durant is not going to play for the Celtics. If he gets traded to the Celtics, the Celtics are going to have to give up everything for him. That is not named Jason Tatum. And I just don't see the two of them working well together. I see the Celtics being in lottery pick formation sooner rather than later. If that move happens. For Russ going to Utah, Utah is like the whitest state in the union and they have had issues with other players. Remember the incident, I think it was in last year's playoffs with John Morant's mom, not good. Russell Westbrook has tried to fight people in Washington because of things that they have said to him, throwing popcorn on him. He is the definition of a hissing radiator. And I can't imagine him being in a more fervent fan base, which probably has similar issues with race and so forth that Boston does. I'm not saying Utah is outright racist, but they've certainly had some problematic things and I just don't see Russell Westbrook fitting in there. They're trying to move on with other big stars like Donovan Mitchell and I just, (laughs) Russell Westbrook, why? What does Russell Westbrook add to your team other than just a giant headache? I don't think he's worth it. Kevin Durant might be worth it because I think Kevin Durant may still be playing in his prime. He's getting close to the end of it though, he's 34. So how many prime years of Kevin Durant are you going to get? I don't even know if you had prime years of Russell Westbrook, if it would be worth it, but he is certainly well past that averaging a triple double for the season. Both of these moves are laughable and talk about a perfect storm of teams that they could go to that just would be the worst ideas ever. I can't even begin to describe to you how awful of an idea it would be. And it just makes me laugh. This off season has been very, very interesting for, for many, many teams. The Boston Celtics overachieved making it to the NBA Finals. I think that that's fair. They played elite defense. They turned the ball over a lot, but their offense was live and die by the three. It just wasn't my cup of tea, and I didn't think that they were going to beat Golden State. And guess what? They didn't. That was a prediction that I made on Drip, Trip, and Spill, and I couldn't believe that it came true. But just because they get Kevin Durant doesn't mean they have a chance. And I think that it would blow up any team chemistry that they have built over last year with the players only meeting 
going from 25 and 25 to making the finals, I just, I don't know. Their window might be closed, but Kevin Durant is not the answer. And Russell Westbrook might not be the answer for anybody. I don't see him being a glue guy. I don't see him be a cohesive teammate and sending him to a place like Utah. I don't know. I just don't see it. Those are crazy moves. And I'm just, I'm laughing internally because if both of those things happen, bad things are on the horizon for both franchises. Well, everybody, another episode back, my first monologue episode back. And uh, you know what? It's great to be back. I appreciate everybody who listened. I appreciate you listening now. You came back and supported the show and drove last week. It made me feel good. And I'm so glad to be back giving you this fire content related to sports. I hope that this finds you well. I hope that you are happy. I hope that you are safe. And as always, I will talk to you next week. Peace, everybody. The opinions and viewpoints expressed on Drippin' Sports with Matty Ice are those of Matt Freights and his guests, and not necessarily those of the Matty Ice Media Network. Drippin' Sports with Matty Ice is exclusively owned by Matt Freights and is brought to you by the Matty Ice Media Network.